privacy in the terms of security or national security. I'm a bit afraid we can't. Can you hear me? Give it, give it, give it. Give it. I'm no, it's, it's, it hasn't gone to green, just keep on. Has it gone to green? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Ah. Uh, I'm, I'm really afraid we don't have enough time to go into a too much detail on each of the issues, as exciting as they are, I, I know these discussions and I love them. Um, I would just love to, to have um, a bit more, um, uh, a few more ideas from the people who haven't spoken yet on, on what they are interested in and what they see as things that have emerged over this week here or over the last year and that may uh, maybe should be taken up by the privacy coalition. And then we only have like 22 minutes left and we still have to a bit more concrete and, and practical talk, talk about what exactly are we going to do over the next year and who is going to do it. I don't know, like the, the main question is, are we, are we going towards that vision that internet is a tool and therefore all the things that we are doing here, all these IDF meetings, having coalitions, having, I don't know, all these ideas coming forward, do we really make an impact? Mm -hmm. You see, that's a, to me a question. And also, I feel that so many things have been happening, and unless I attend here, I will not know uh, what's happening really. Let's suppose we are 1,200 delegates. We are here. Now, are we a multiplier effect when we go back to our own places? How, how do we make this known to other, other members of society? Because like, we are privileged to come here. I can make known to my group. It's a small group. Now, there are so many people who are not knowing anything of what's happening. So how do we also like the, uh, disseminate all what's happening here, the positive things that have happened so far? <coughs> That's a question for me. Good question. <laughs> Just um, I think you're, you're hitting it right to the point, uh, and that's what we have to address now. Uh, just one thing, the IGF theoretically has a mandate to um, make decisions. Uh, paragraph 72G of the Tunis Agenda um, allows the IGF to make recommendations on emerging issues. And that's actually, that was one of the reasons why we in the Privacy Coalition from the beginning have focused on, or at least partially focused on emerging issues like digital identity management and so on. Um, because we thought this might be an interesting way to also push the limits of the IGF a bit and of what's uh, being done within the IGF framework and see if we, after a few years of work, and, and consolidation of our discussions can actually come up with something like recommendations. But as I said, um, work has been less dynamic over the last year than we had hoped for. So, yeah, I'd, I'd love to have some ideas from you um, how to proceed. And uh, I still want to hear the people who haven't spoken yet. So, uh, just to add some Indian uh, context. Yeah, sorry. Just to add some Indian context to the debate on privacy, uh, while yes, of course, we don't have a national legislation covering uh, uh, an all-encompassing uh, um, umbrella legislation on privacy. However, there are certain or very specific safeguards peppered across various legislations that do provide some uh, some uh, modicum of uh, of protection. Constitution, of course, is one which uh, doesn't specifically provide, but Supreme Court has very consistently now read in the right of uh, right of privacy as an inherent right and has uh, incorporated it into the right of life. Of course, that has its limitations. It can only be enforced against the state, not against private individuals, and all of that. There are other legislations like the Juvenile Protection Act. You cannot disclose the identity of a minor involved in an offense or who is the victim of an offense. There is an, uh, you cannot disclose the identity of a victim of rape offense. Uh, and this is enforced very, uh, very stringently. You, uh, uh, media companies, any, any publishing company has to blur the, uh, the, blur the face, disclose, uh, uh, I mean, uh, obliterate the name, or um, j just cannot give any identifying characteristic of a victim of rape. So there, are, there is a positive movement uh, uh, towards recognizing the importance and relevance of privacy. Uh, apart from that, the industry is taking a lot of steps. NASCOM has started a self-regulation mechanism for uh, members of NASCOM uh, to self-regulate privacy uh, uh, initiatives within, their, uh, within the industry. And that has, again, evinced a lot of interest from the industry. So there are a lot of positive steps there. 
uh, contractually, and uh, this I speak not as much from my uh, in my capacity in my current capacity, but from my past experience, I was uh, working with an outsourcing company, and uh, at a, at an individual level, companies have uh, have almost adopted the EU di directive on data protection. It's enforced contractually. It's a part. Uh, the governing law is made of uh, of that I mean of the of that jurisdiction, um, in uh, uh, primarily because of uh, concerns on data protection in the outsourcing industry. It's very common to find the governing law for European uh, countries because um, essentially that jurisdiction provides the highest safeguard on privacy. So I would definitely say that there is, uh, even at the private level, you know, when, uh, just to share an example, when camera phones first came, there was a lot of privacy concern because some people were misusing those, uh, the, the opportunity to take pictures and uh, stuff like that. And one of the leading camera phone companies themselves came out with an advertisement com campaign which showed a father clicking the picture of a, of a to toddler child. And the child grabs the phone and throws it on the ground. And after that, just the <laughs> caption comes, respect privacy. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, this is a, an initiative uh, which is finding, finding credence and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and acceptability. And it's just a matter of time where it becomes enshrined in to a legislation, and we do look to our government to do that. And we, there are enough, uh, uh, enough uh, bodies and initiatives which are uh, in engagement and dialogue with the government to get them to do that. But uh, at at a personal level, for people who are involved in this industry or are directly impacted, I would say there is a, a definite acceptance towards the concept of uh, uh, privacy. Hi, uh, uh, Rishi Jaitley with Google here. Um, just um, sorry for coming in late. Maybe this was discussed earlier. Just want to try and reframe some of the uh, some of the conversation just from our vantage point. You know, when we think about um, our sort of policy positions, particularly in this part of the world, we work backwards from a goal of a thriving internet economy, a thriving internet economy where e-commerce is is uh, occurring in a sort of trustworthy way and, and the way we think about it is innovation. And, um, and so I think, you know, in some ways, you know, the, the debate about privacy in, in this part of the world is about, you know, data coming in and, um, and uh, safeguards within a, home within a particular jurisdiction for foreign data coming in. But if you work backwards from that end state, which is an end state where, where you have you know, uh, amazing uh, Indian internet sites, Pakistani internet sites, sites in Thailand, as opposed to them relying on foreign sites. Um, what tends to happen, you know, whereas in the West we can we can kind of, um, you know, it, it's easy to kind of let the innovation happen and then think about privacy at a later at a later stage. M one worry I have about kind of about turning up the noise on privacy. In, in perhaps its current form in, in economies where we still don't see e-commerce thriving at its maximum potential is, um, is by introducing privacy as perhaps currently packaged, you further dissuade um, uh, innovators and make perhaps make it more difficult to innovate. All I'm suggesting is that innovation ought to be a um, a, a central component of the narrative, of the overall privacy narrative. What, it, what does privacy have to do with innovation and the end state of a, of a thriving internet economy? Because um, as I hear the debate, um, you know, we, we on many occasions have toyed with, you know, should we ourselves as a company turn up noise on privacy, op-eds, whatever it is, in, in, for instance, a South Asian context. And one worry we always have, and, and we've done it here and there, but one worry we always have is, is how do you walk the fine line between um, doing so in a way that entrepreneurs and innovators feel as though um, it's just another obstacle they have uh, before they can, you know, unleash their service. Um, and, and, uh, and giving them the sense that, you know, the priority ought to be your creative idea. Um, and, then we, and then we can think of it. So just, just thinking about reframing and, and the overall narrative. I, I think that's a very interesting point. But um, I think there might be a parallel to the 1990s development of e-commerce in the US and across Europe. But I think we're missing an opportunity to also do what, what happened back then, which was back in those days, communications 
the regulations were not adapted well to innovation and or privacy, such as with the use of cryptography and trust in electronic commerce was used a lot in the debates to allow for uh, liberalization of privacy enhancing technologies and to make space for electronic commerce to thrive. Uh, and that essentially resulted in the dest destruction of bad government policies. I think we should allow that process to take place here too. And I think we shouldn't be promoting e-commerce without actually talking about consumer rights and consumer issues and privacy and security are inherent to that. I don't, um, I'm not, yeah, so I, I see the role in innovation. I think absolutely we need innovation. We need to promote it in this region. But it doesn't mean that that has to come at the cost of trust and confidence in these transactions, which was the whole just the 1990s debate, and that's why we have electronic commerce and innovation in the, in the U.S. and Western Europe. It's because of those debates. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Raman from the National Law School. Uh, just a concern, most of the narratives and the discourse surrounding privacy here, and especially if you notice, and I notice is that there's no government representative, for example, in most privacy discussions here, or if they are, they're, they're regarding uh, data protection concerns, for example, concerns in relation to framing data protection laws, uh, Microsoft, Google's involvement with them, engaging with them as to that, and all of that seems to be flowing some sort of, you know, after the EU's e-commerce di directives and all of those sort of points. When it comes to human rights and privacy, there's nearly no real engagement in the developing world, and like, and, and that's especially of concern because of, you know, for example, all of you have been reading the statements again and again about Bombay, about uh, the attacks there, concerns there, security concerns which have been going on in the main session. Uh, post that, there's increasing likelihood that already existing pervasive surveillance, and like I'd argue, for example, in India and a lot of countries, even democratic ones, there's pervasive surveillance happening of uh, internet communication, and at least of common ac access points. Uh, it's going to get worse. Data retention is also going to happen. Now, the interesting thing here is, they are legitimate rights potentially within the constitution even or within whatever your ambiguous constitutions and in whatever in india shares that with, the, with america and with the eu as to not being clear on what privacy is but even those concerns about those norms and those values isn't happening and won't happen because there doesn't seem to be a concern with the government that this is a power that has to be regulated. If you talk about data protection, yes, 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 they're concerned because e-commerce and commercial matters are something which gets the attention of most uh, governments, especially in the developing world. But when it comes to the human rights aspect of that, despite the fact that there is a framework from which they can build upon, they won't build upon it because it's not really a concern and there's no sharing experiences. For example, most Indian lawyers arguing in the Supreme Court don't know about comparable, for example, the German Constitutional Court's cases or the European Court of Human Rights long jurisprudence as to limiting the power of the state to, or so putting in tests in regards to how you intercept da uh, data. So this is constant, this thing that the internet's the wild west, especially concerns, and you've heard from about legitimate concern about child pornography and all those other matters, that there's an increased call to regulate it without building on existing frameworks. So at least sharing more experiences on that one, and perhaps going back to what the, Inter the Internet Bill of Rights Coalition has been talking about, not building certain core standards, and perhaps at least you know model principles, because those at least are effective. If you see OECD guidelines lying around, which they've been lying around here in the forum uh, throughout the past few days, those are useful things to at least get the attention of state representatives, so especially for the next IGF. Perhaps we should be looking at perhaps building some of those at least, or perhaps reminding governments that they have certain constitutional concerns they should be remembering and certain basic principles like the UDHR. I. I think the governments have a tremendously difficult task, and I'm not sure, but I think you may be underestimating it. Um, they are also tasked with protecting the people, and they are also tasked with letting them have free speech, and they are also tasked in some cases, I disagree with my colleague, I believe the United States has been very clear that you do not have a right to privacy. I think it's unfortunate, but I think it's a fact. <laughs> um, in some places you do, but then you've got to balance all three of those. And I don't think that, I, mean, I think it's the same problem with the child protection. We're not having the conversations across these groups. I wind up in, at Microsoft all the time. 
And I have to talk to the law enforcement people who say, you know, if you can't give me that data, then I can't get the person who just murdered six people over there. And so when we form our policies, and we're not a government, but we have been placed in this horrendous position, as has Google and others, of possessing data and we don't have to comply with our government laws. We can and do fight them in court over some things. We have to decide where we will invest in the fight and where we will say they're right. And in general, we say they are right when it's imminent harm, when there's you know, serious crime involved. Uh, most people don't find that surprising, but it's very clear that's a limit on, from our point of view, that's a limit on your right to privacy. If you're using it as a shield for criminal activities of a significant kind, we will give that away, I mean, unless we're forced by a government to protect it, but I don't think that's the right decision for a government. And making those trade-offs is tremendously difficult. So getting them in and having the conversation, I think, is the right thing to do, but expecting them to consider privacy to be the lead when you're going privacy, freedom of expression, and you know, security just doesn't, I, I wouldn't take that position as a, per, that's a personal statement, that's not a Microsoft statement. I personally wouldn't take that, that position, so it's really tricky. Um, just point of order, we have five minutes left to the official end of this meeting. Um, I'm not sure that there's uh, the lunch break afterwards, so um, we also can go over time if you want to. Um, we should, um, before we all um, go somewhere else, we should agree on what we do over the next year and who is going to take care that it actually happens. Um, that's some things I really want to, to have answered here before we um, close the meeting. Um, so I don't know, do we, shall we go over time a bit? Is that okay? Until quarter past one or so? Can't. You can't? Can. Oh, okay. Okay, I see some people nodding, some people say they have to leave. Um, Let's try to get it done. Okay, I just quickly, uh, one, one thing um, I, I just want to mention, we don't have to uh, have time to really discuss it, but um, one thing uh, I discussed with Caspar Bowden from Microsoft, who has been very active in this coalition from the beginning, um, and we discussed this over the week, um, one emerging issue he sees, or we see, is um, that there's some important transformation of the whole internet going on at the moment. That usually the, the classical model of the internet is that the intelligence is at the edges and the network is just a dump network of tubes, you know. <laughs> the internet is a series of tubes. Um, and this seems to be changing, that a lot more intelligence is built into the network, into the routers, uh, into the core routers and so on. And um, this is connected with technologies like deep packet inspection and, and layer 7 switches and intelligent switching and so on. And that may have, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it will have, a big impact on the privacy options for people who use the network. That's also, just to mention it, uh, something that Casper and I agree um, that um, that is a, an important emerging issue um, that we also could address in this coalition. One thing in general I, I think we have to keep in mind is if we discuss things within the context of the IGF, um, we should try to um, to focus on the global public policy aspects. You know, it's okay to, to also discuss and uh, exchange views and experiences on, on local and national initiatives and how to do your best privacy law on the national level or how to do education in your community and so on. But in fact, the mandate of the IGF is to discuss global public policy issues. So maybe that also could help us to, to keep a bit of focus. So um, I would love to hear some ideas on um, how we proceed over the next year before we hopefully meet again in Cairo. Uh, we have a perception of what is going on in different countries and there is uh, no collaborative effort to see how we can learn from each other's experiences. Uh, my name is Shaila Mistry. I'm representing the Federation of uh, University Women based in uh, Geneva and I'm also on the International um, Internet Bill of Rights. And uh, 
The thing that concerns me are the comments. I am from India, I'm from here, Hyderabad, but I live in California. And many of the comments that were made about the American model do worry me. When we say we have privacy, we have all of these elaborate systems or protection, I laugh because that is ridiculous. There is no element of privacy. We have two values that are at conflict. One is the privacy uh, elaborate infrastructure that has grown as a result I think it's driven more by the legal model rather than by the idea of respect for human rights. And I think this goes across the board, whether it's the education field, whether it's medical field, or whatever. Basically, it's legally driven in the sense of how do you cover your liability. So therefore, we have privacy issues. I think one of the few areas where uh, privacy is actually addressed properly is in the private sector, and I am from the private sector. We're not happy with what is being done, but at least the f problems are being uh, addressed because the private sector is sink or swim. We do not have time to, to wallow in things. Uh, your company will go away. So we are trying to solve those problems. Now the other area that there is a conflict of values is the kind of culture that uh, we, we have in the United States where there is no concept of privacy. All our children are sharing intimate details of their lives on Facebook, wherever, very, very comfortably. People are living their lives on the internet uh, and online. So where has privacy gone in that situation? So I think we have two values that are of conflict. So I bring it back to what I'm saying, that it would be nice on a global level. Um, it would be very useful for us to, to, to be able to learn from what's going on in different models and put something together with that. So we're not each of us uh, inventing the wheel. Any suggestions on how to operationalize this for absolutely, our work absolutely. over the last in, year? In my, well, in my other hat, I do a lot of public policy. In California, I'm one of the people that pass a law against human trafficking, trafficking of women and children. Um, so uh, th that took four years of effort. And how did we do it? By coalitions. Uh, getting people together, learning what has been done in different countries. I serve on the CSW, uh, Commission on Status of Women, in, um, in New York. And uh, just learning what is happening in different countries, bringing people together, and then working back. You work on a global level, but then you pull back and you work in your own area. So we need to learn from each other, and I think that's not happening. I heard several examples of what's happening. In the, in, in, what I heard was excuses or explanation of what's happening or not happening in India, and I'm Indian too, and, and that bothers me because there is an assumption that what we have in the United States or in the Western world is so much better and it's working, and it isn't. So I think we need to come to the table, we need to be talking documents, always it comes down to documents. I, I know it's a terrible thing, you bring documents, you get people to the table, you write things down, and then you work together, you take it back, work with your governments. And I know with our government, with the uh, US government, there's very little communication. We hope that's <coughs> going to, we hope very much that's going to change. Thank you. Konstantinos wants to reply directly. Thank you. Uh, my name is Konstantinos Kumaitis, and I just came a little bit late, but I am, a, well, I have a legal background, and one of the problems with privacy is that it is a very abstract right, and you know it's not very clearly defined, and governments are really trying to define. I would like to echo uh, what you, Shaina, what you say, uh, what you said. Uh, in the United States, the regime is not that much better. In, the Euro in Europe, is not even that great, even though we believe in strong regulation. Uh, one of the problems with privacy is that the internet is taking the right of privacy to wherever it is it wants to be taken. So right now, we have social networking sites. Social networking sites is not a phenomenon in the United States. It's all over the world. Facebook, we've heard it, we've read it, keeps information even though you delete your profile. and. Uh, the, that information is visible online, and the whole idea behind the right of privacy it is that is that the more information someone has on you, the better it is to control you or notional control you. And I really think that a very good way is, and the only way that I see, first of all, documents. But these documents need to come from collaborations between the industry and people that are really concerned about privacy because it is the industry that determines how the internet develops and 
the more the internet develops, the more issues on privacy arise. I mean, for example, right now you have Web 2.0 and you have the issue of privacy 2.0 whereby I am able to record anybody uh, with my mobile, post it up on YouTube, and that's it. That's done. Infringement of privacy becomes an automatic phenomenon. So people and users that were subject to privacy by governments and governmental agencies and businesses, if you want, right now, they also become the ones that are infringing, actually, privacy. And we don't really realize the whole dimension of privacy. So I really agree with what you said. It is an issue of collaboration, but at this stage, I really, want, I really believe that it is, we need to focus on the collaboration between the private sector and initiatives like yourself in the coalition. Thank you. concept that was, that was raised by the last gentleman who spoke is tremendously important because I don't think we figured out organizations get treated differently than individuals. When individuals become the publishers of information that infringe your privacy because they've shown your picture or something else, that's uncharted waters. We have no idea even how the law applies to those people because it's an individual acting as an organization in a non-commercial space on a public network. And there hasn't been a whole way of figuring out how to deal with those people and what they're doing. And I think one of the things which gets lost sometimes in the conversation is everyone has a role to play in assuring privacy, both the individual, but usually we think of the individual as the user. And usually it's the, gee, did you push the button that updates your virus protection? Well, here we have a very different thing because the user is the actor. And the user is the publisher of new information. And I think we would also agree that we don't want the vehicles through which they're publishing this to be censoring what these people are publishing. So we have to figure out how to address that dichotomy of you want to allow maximal content and innovation to the actual end user because user generated content is a great thing. But how you put respect into that context is something we haven't figured out. The, the other point to the last comment that I'd like to make is a couple of people have mentioned documents and the need to drive documents. I would argue the IGF plays a more important role than the document. And in fact, the document may be at cross purposes to the greatest benefit that the IGF has. The second you introduce a document, you introduce negotiation. The second you introduce negotiation, you constrain conversation. And the second you constrain conversation, you actually constrain the thinking that leads you to new solutions. In many ways, what we have to figure out with the IGF is how to take the thinking that occurs in the IGF and move it into some of the other places that are the document driving places. I think if you drive the documents into the IGF, the conversation will naturally become constrained. People will start taking defensive positions and negotiated positions, and that takes away one of the unique features of the IGF, which is this is an open, collaborative co conversation. But I do agree with the person who said, the number of government people who are involved in the conversation on privacy here is way too small. You've got industry with a growing representation. You've got civil society with a very good representation. I don't know that we have individuals per se, but I'll say that civil society will stand in the stead of the individual. Um, but governments really aren't part of that conversation, and that needs to be a, a much broader and more robust conversation. Just a quick footnote on, on the documents. I think that's that's a very large uh, um, um, spectrum of what that can mean. It doesn't necessarily have to mean uh, negotiated uh, documents agreed by all 190 UN member states and so on. Just the fact that I'm ta uh, taking notes here and that we have some draft issue papers that were developed over the last two years in this coalition. These are all documents, you could say. We, yeah, we don't necessarily have to uh, have a mechanism for the IGF plenary to agree on them. No, no, but the, the just I think the, the idea was it's it's nice to have all these discussions in the coalition, but it also would be nice to have more tangible outputs that we can then reprodu uh, reproduce. And, 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 and I'm not suggesting you don't take notes of the conversation. Obviously, you can't take the thoughts that occurred in here if you don't have notes to take them with you. None of our memories are that good. Um, but I, I think what you want to stay away from is that the, the formalization of the positions, because there, there's a, 
there's a, one of the things that IGF is meant to do is help coordinate things that are going on in a lot of the other organizations too. So there's work going on at the OECD on privacy and enforcement. They're doing work on identity management. They're doing work on a number of other issues. How can you take some of the thinking from here and bring it into there? There are, I, I mean, Privacy International does papers on this kind of stuff. How can that thinking inform them? You have, you have groups of chief privacy officers on the industry side. How can the work being done inform them? Because it's the brainstorming and the thought process that is tremendously useful. I'm just concerned that if you get too much into a document as the output, because everyone loves documents because deliverable, deliverables mean we can say we accomplish something. Because for some reason a conversation is never an accomplishment. And my issue is I believe the conversation is in fact the most important accomplishment because that's not what's happening in the rest of the organizations. document isn't the end in itself. Uh, we have the conversation, we learn from each other, we put together a document, but that document actually has to bring about a change, a change in the way things are being done. It's not a document that becomes a, it exists for itself, but that it reflects a change in the system, a change in the mentality of of an organization, and I think that's what we should be moving towards. And then you asked, how do we move forward? Another way to move forward is to bring some new players into the, into the, into the scene. And I'm very gratified to see that the private sector is no longer the bad guy in this arena. I have worked in humanitarian uh, uh, field for many, many years, and I always kept the fact that I have a successful technology company, very low profile. So. Uh, I'm very pleased to see the private sector is being respected. But at the same time, I also want to say that we do not want to see the private sector as a homogenous group. There, there are the large companies, and their issues and perspectives are different. But there is also a very important animal that has existed in the private sector for a very long time, and that is the small and medium business owners. The small and medium business owners are the tigers of the economy. We understand how things work. If we do not understand them, we're going to get eaten. So we have to survive. And there are many things, uh, uh, proprietary knowledge that, and, and strategies that private uh, enterprise of small businesses, small and medium business have, that I think we should bring in here so that we can learn and, and, and adopt some new, new methodology. <coughs> Thank you. First of all, sorry, I couldn't attend uh, earlier the, the workshop. Uh, I'm Michel Valerave, representing the Internet Observatory in Belgium, which is the national IGF. And I'm also professor at the University of Antwerp on the ICT and uh, privacy uh, aspects. Um, well, I would like to make a, a kind of Belgian compromise. We're specialized in that in our uh, complex country. So I think um, discussions and papers are a starting point and I would like to give one example unfortunately the gentleman from Google left but I, I wanted to react uh, on his uh, statement by giving an example in our country we have that famous or horrible uh, opt-in system in uh, Europe and in Belgium in, uh, in particular and um, Although businesses have lobbied against it uh, for several years, we have had a uh, working group uh, with businesses, with our data protection authority and other organizations, consumer organizations, etc. And now businesses in our country are saying, well, uh, that opt-in uh, system, that permission marketing uh, system is positioning us, is profiling us as a business, uh, against the other ones, um, against the stream of uh, unsolicited commercial emails that uh, businesses receive or that uh, uh, also employees receive but also consumers receive. It's only an example huh? uh, to give you also um, another position that sometimes privacy is not to stop innovation or marketing or refrain it, but it can become a unique selling 
selling proposition or something <laughs> where a business can uh, profile or position itself against uh, or um, against uh, um, competitors, for example. Yeah. So I think to to answer to your question, how uh, can we deal with those issues and how can we we meet each other? Uh, first of all, I think that uh, we can. Uh, share some documents about good practices in in our different countries but maybe there are also other international meetings in between two IGFs some uh, privacy conferences or other conferences that we could attend and that prior or after that conference we could have more time to discuss with uh, with each other and share uh, that information and that experience very good point um, I think either uh, um, no matter if we just want to have conversations or if we want to build um, or develop some some texts uh, out of these conversations the conversations have to take place somewhere and at some time and uh, that's actually what what we did in the first year um, quite sometimes uh, we had um, a two-day meeting I think in Geneva connected to the IGF consultations in, in May 2007 um, and then a couple of meetings alongside uh, conferences like computers, freedom, and privacy, and so on. So maybe, and uh, looking at the clock, uh, that's we, we really should close here. Um, that's something we probably uh, now can agree on in the last minutes. Where and when do, should we meet next, and what should we do there, and who is taking care of that? <laughs> So one, one idea I, I have in mind is um, there's a big um, conference, a privacy and data protection conference in Brussels in mid-January, which is really exciting. And uh, in a, in a, yeah, <laughs> a, num a number of us will be there. I'm, I'm sure not everybody can come to Brussels or will come to Brussels in January, but that may be an idea where we can um, reserve some time to, to um, work on these issues further. And probably I think it's, it's time to um, also for this coalition um, to get a bit less Eurocentric. So I would really love to see some people, for example, from India or elsewhere, um, when, when you have um, privacy or other related conferences here in India or in Asia, that you just organize, and uh, maybe on the coalition mailing list, just organize, um, get a slot and a room somewhere, and just meet, and then report back on the list. Uh, maybe that's, that's the thing to do, and not have these central coordinators who try to take care of everything. Um, I think the most important thing right now you can do and should do if you want to keep in, uh, stay involved in the Privacy Coalition is um, go to our website, to the wiki, and um, subscribe to our mailing list. And then um, maybe uh, give a short introduction there and say um, what are you willing to contribute. And maybe Gus and I should also say a few words about how we see our coordinator role in the future because um, as I said we haven't been really that dynamic over the last year so maybe starting with myself um, from, from um, what I've learned over the last year um, I probably because of my job and other obligations um, I won't be able to put a lot of uh, time into substantial work here um, what I probably can and will do is um, tracking the important deadlines uh, connected to the IGF you know when we have to deliver the reports from this meeting when we have to apply for workshops for next year and for for coalition meeting slots and uh, when we have to reserve a room for a meeting in Geneva in May things like that the more the more formal link to the IGF secretariat. I probably can do that. Maybe can take care of one or two meetings alongside conferences where I'm going anyway. Uh, but I probably won't be able to take care of substantial work here. Um, that's something, okay, my offer, so to speak. Um, what about you guys? I'm a little bit of the opposite. I can't do any of the coordination work, but I will take on some work on this privacy and development issue because oh, cool. um, it's part of some work that we're doing in Asia more mm -hmm. generally. Sorry, Mr. Wait. Gus. Yeah. I would love to see some, some um, show of hands here who of you would like to um, take on some kind of um, like more official responsibility for this coalition and say, yeah, you will. I'm not sure which part I'll fill in, but yes, I'll fill in. Great, okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, we'd like to be from the Center for 
uh, from the Center for Internet Society, we'd like to be a uh, part of the discussions mm -hmm. uh, that go on, and I, and I already am on the mailing list. Okay. Uh, but uh, we have our hands full with, with lots of other issues, and, and we are on Everybody a few has. other dynamic coalitions right now. So uh, I, I don't think officially uh, we'd want to be part of the dynamic coalitions, but but uh, I, I think the, all the more discussions that, that uh, and, and ideas from different places that can inform uh, decisions that go into this, uh, I, I think uh, the richer the, the dynamic coalition will be. So be, uh, I, I'd be happy to take part in all the online conversations that way. Okay. <clears throat> and perhaps uh, the offline conversations also, uh, a couple of conferences or something. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Actually, at, at one of the meetings we had in the first year, um, the International Chamber of Commerce and, and some other business representatives I'm were... A vice, I'm a vice chair of the ICC. Okay, yeah, Aisha was uh, taking part in, in our one-day meeting in Geneva and so on. Yeah. Okay, so um, we have, uh, hopefully we have a few new members on our mailing list uh, over the next one or two days. Um, we will hopefully <coughs> meet again over the year and then see what we actually get done on substantive issues. And then we all meet again in Cairo, I guess. Okay, um, thanks for a very dynamic meeting. <laughs> Great to have you here. Thank you. Just thought I'd give a few more.